Welcome to the OCC Podcast. Whether you're listening to this at home, on the road, at work, or in the gym, we're so glad you decided to join us as we study God's Word together. We hope and pray that through this ministry, you will grow in your relationship with God as well as become a chair for disciple maker. But for now, sit back and let us help you see how the Bible applies to your life today. Well, good evening. Didn't that just make you want to stand up and dance or run? No. <laughs> That's okay. It's okay. So, hope you're having all a great summer, enjoying the, the heat wave that we're having now. It's finally stopped raining. Now we get the heat for the next two months, probably. Hopefully, no fires and smoke and all of that. So, for those of us that, that haven't met, my name's Forrest. I'm, I serve on staff here as the Connection Pastor at OCC, and I get the great joy of introducing people to Rooted Small Group Ministries as well as the other care ministries like Celebrate Recovery, Grief Share, and Marriage Enrichment. Stay tuned as, this, uh, as we roll these out this summer. Uh, a little bit later in August, we're going to have a, a docket of events. The, from the men's and women's ministries that we'll have uh, introduced at the Connections Fair towards the end of August. And I'd like you to please give uh, serious thought, not only to participating in these ministries, but also making a specific commitment to serving in our church family. Generally, these opportunities uh, have just only limited time commitments, and they have limited responsibilities, so it's really very easy to say, yes, I can volunteer for one day or one week or one month to help with the children's department or the youth department or whatever it is, knowing that we're all taking turns we all share the load. So in the end, I think that you'll find it, as I have, it, it is very rewarding to do the Lord's work. Today we're going to spend the next half hour walking through Luke chapter 23, verses 50 through 56, detailing the burial of Jesus And we'll gain an understanding of the providential power of God using prophecy and events and people to accomplish his purpose and will. More importantly, how we can participate in God's work in these present days. The burial of Christ is a divinely orchestrated event. It's both amazing and it's supernatural. We understand the significance of the crucifixion and the resurrection, but have we given thought and considered the burial. The burial of Jesus is a strong affirmation of his deity, the sovereignty of God, the veracity of scripture, and the purpose of history. First, let's look at the two ways God works supernaturally in the world, uh, by miracles and by providence. A miracle is a means by which God uh, accomplishes his purpose And he does so by interrupting or suspending or overruling the natural order of things. Providence is how God accomplishes exactly what he plans, purposes, promises, and prophesies. And he does it without interrupting or suspending or overruling the natural order of things. He does this by pulling together and orchestrating all the free behaviors of all people, all contingencies, all events, all actions and reactions. Listen to this illustration that relates this in a way that we can understand. One cold, wintry day in Denver, Colorado, while people were absorbed in the activities of life, a backdrop of snow and sleet fell to the ground. As the people of Denver went about their daily routines, one woman was focused solely on her child. Today was the day that she was taking her newborn baby home from the hospital after a longer than usual stay. Shortly after birth, the child had open heart surgery. Although the doctor probably didn't have to tell her, he reminded the new mom to be extra careful with the fragile child. So she buckled the newborn safely in the car seat. She got in herself. She locked the door, put on her seatbelt, and drove towards home. Icy rain and snow accumulated on the roads as she turned on Interstate 25. The wind picked up, blowing snow across the road, making it more difficult to see. She tightened her grip on the steering wheel and glanced in the back seat of her newborn. The windshield wipers moving in fast motion, squinting and tense, she noticed something unusual ahead. 
a car had skidded out of control and turned sideways. She was headed straight for it. She reacted quickly and she slammed her foot on the brake. Her mind was on her frail post-operative child as her car slid, heading right for the car in front of her. They slid down the interstate and they stopped only inches from the other car. No impact whatsoever. Inches from a collision that could have been life-threatening. Before a sigh of relief could be released from her lungs, she noticed a semi-truck barreling down the highway and skidding right towards the two cars stuck in the traffic lane. She heard the brakes of the truck squeal as it jackknifed and slid toward her car. The front of the truck stopped less than a foot from the hood of her car, and the back of the truck surrounded the other end of her car. Again, no impact at least for her vehicle carrying the frail baby. What occurred behind the truck was a 60-car pileup. Cars crashed into the truck and into one another, and it was one of the worst accidents the city had seen. But there, at the front of the heap, was a car carrying a newborn baby recuperating from open-heart surgery. As the media descended on the area, a, a reporter interviewed his, the mother, and she told the reporter, it was like I was in a circle of indemnity, a circle of protection. Does not God work in crazy ways? For this woman and her frail baby, God had a plan ordained to allow them not only to go through open heart surgery and survive, but also to survive this horrific crash. Doesn't God work the same in our lives? It can feel like the bad things just keep piling on. The sickness, on top of financial crisis, on top of marital issues, on top of and on top of. But God sees us in the midst of all that, and he hasn't forgotten us. He loves us and is not trying to hurt us, but instead strengthen us in the midst of these trials. And we'll see that more throughout our text. So let's continue with reading today's scripture. Luke chapter 23, verses 50 through 56. We'll have it on the screen. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man. He had not consented to their decision and action, though, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, he wrapped it in a linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him, Jesus, from Galilee, followed and saw the tomb <clears throat> and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments, and on the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. So you may have noticed as we preach through the book of Luke, periodic references to the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are similar, but they're written to different audiences. Matthew was written towards a Jewish audience. Mark was aimed at those who lived outside Palestine. And it tells more of what Jesus did and less of what Jesus said. While Luke was aimed at the Greek mind and written in a comprehensive, logical, and orderly manner. We also reference the gospel according to John, which is very different than the synoptic gospels. It offers the things that Jesus said more than the things he did. Step by step, this gospel unfolds the truth until the reader must reach the inescapable conclusion that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. The question to ask ourselves is, what does each want you to see in the gospel? Think about the story you've heard about there's, there's four people standing on a street corner and they witness a car crash. The police, they question each of them independently and each person has a different version of what actually happened. They're all correct. They just process the information differently from the same event. Now let's move on to our first point. God uses people to accomplish his purpose. First up, we see Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, which we know to be the, the Jewish high court, so he was a member of the Sanhedrin. 
Matthew tells us that he was a rich man who himself had become a disciple of Jesus. Though John tells us he kept it a secret for fear of the Jews. But Joseph was a believer, a good and righteous man looking for the kingdom of God. He had not consented to the council's decision and action to mean the counsel given by Caiaphas to the final condemnation. The second, the unofficial acts such as the compact with Judas and the delivery to Pilate. Joseph is the one man who had the courage to step up and ask Pilate for the body of Christ as a personal favor. And then he put the body in his own unused tomb for burial. Along with Nicodemus mentioned in the book of John. And these are the only two that came to the funeral of Jesus. Also in John, three of the women who had accompanied Jesus from Galilee, they're mentioned. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary's sister, the wife of Clopas. And Mary Magdalene. These three followed Joseph and Nicodemus to the tomb and saw how the body of Jesus was laid. After witnessing this, they then returned home to prepare spices and perfumes for the body, intending to return to the tomb after the Sabbath. And you'll hear more about these women after the resurrection. One last observation about people involved in events up to this point. Remember the soldiers mentioned in Mark uh, chapter 15, verse 39? And when the centurion who was standing right in front of him saw the way that he breathed his last, he said, truly this was the Son of God. He was saved. How about the one thief that's quoted in Luke chapter 23, verses 41 through 43? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. He was saved. And Nicodemus, first mentioned in John chapter 3 and again in chapter uh, 19, obviously he was a believer. He was saved. Then there's Joseph, an unexpected testimony of, of faith in Christ by a member of the Sanhedrin. And he was saved. The providential power of God is shown in the transformed lives of these four individuals involved in the burial of Jesus before they even understood the coming resurrection. Look at John chapter 20, verse 9. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. They didn't know on that Friday what you and I now know. They, did not, they didn't know that Friday's tra tragedy would be Sunday's triumph. But we do know the rest of the story. And you can choose to let the Holy Spirit work in your life just as these individuals chose to honor the body of Christ even before you rose. You just need to ask. We read in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and those who are called to his purpose. How would this read in your life? In hospital stays, God works for the good. In divorce papers, God works for the good. In a prison term, God works for the good. As hard as it may be to believe... You could be only a Saturday away from a resurrection. You could be only hours away from that precious prayer of a changed heart. God, did you do this for me? Moving on to our second point, God uses events to accomplish his purpose. One of my favorite stories about intercessory prayer comes from Tony Campolo. A prayer meeting was held for him just before he spoke at a Pentecostal college chapel service. Eight men took Tony to the back room of a chapel, had him kneel. They laid their hands on his head and they began to pray. And that's a good thing, Tony wrote, except for they prayed a long time. And the longer they prayed, the more tired they got. And the more tired they got, the more they leaned on his head. 
I want to tell you that when eight guys are leaning on your head, it doesn't feel so good. To make matters worse, one of the men was not even praying for Tony. He went on and on praying for somebody named Charlie Stolfus. Dear Lord, you know Charlie Stolfus. He lives in that silver trailer down the road a mile. You know that trailer, Lord, just on, down the road on the right-hand side. Tony said he wanted to inform the prayer that it was not necessary to furnish God with directional material. Lord, Charlie told me this morning he's going to leave his wife and three kids. Step in and do something, God, and bring that family back together. Tony writes that he, he finally got the Pentecostal preachers off his head. He delivered his message, and he got in his car to drive home. As he drove onto the Pennsylvania Turnpike, he noticed a hitchhiker, and he picked him up. I'll let him tell it from here. We drove a few minutes, and I said, Hi, my name's Tony Campolo. What's yours? He said, My name's Charlie Stolfus. I couldn't believe it. I got off the turnpike at the next exit, and I headed back. He got a bit uneasy with that, and after a few minutes, he said, Hey, mister, where are you taking me? I said, I'm taking you home. He narrowed his eyes, and he asked, Why? And I said, Because you just left your wife and kids, three kids, right? And that just blew him away. Yeah, yeah, that's right. With shock written all over his face, he plastered himself against the car door, and he never took his eyes off me. Then I really did him in as I drove right to his silver trailer. When I pulled up, his eyes seemed to bulge as he asked, how did you know I live here? I said, God told me. And I believe God did tell me. When he opened the trailer door, his wife exclaimed, you're back. You're back. He whispered in her ear, and the more he talked, the bigger her eyes got. Then I said, with real authority, the two of you sit down. I'm going to talk, and you two are going to listen. And man, did they, li did they listen. That afternoon, I led those two young people to Jesus Christ. A perfect example of God's providential power using the event of Tony speaking at a prayer meeting and then the men praying together to rescue this couple. Then Tony picking up Charlie and taking him home to his wife and kids and then counseling their marriage. God is truly amazing. So back to the burial events, but looking now at the book of Mark, and it'll be on the screen, I'll just have you skip down to verse 44. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him if, whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. So this was Friday. Jesus was crucified at 9 a.m. He gave up his life at 3 p.m. Since the next day was not only the Sabbath, but also the Passover, the most sacred day on the first century Jewish calendar, the Jewish authorities certainly would not have wanted the body to remain on the cross overnight and therefore, and therefore defile the land, as stated in Deuteronomy chapter 21. We can see that there are only a few hours until evening at 6 o'clock when the Passover and the Sabbath day started. Just a few hours for Joseph to purchase the fine linen cloth and preserve the body of Jesus. See in John chapter 19, verse 39. And Nicodemus came also, who had first to come to him by night, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds weight. And they took the body of Jesus and they bound it in linen wrappings with the spices as is the burial custom of the Jews. So it could not be said that it was another body and not that of Christ that was raised from the dead. We read in Matthew chapter 27 verses 59 and 60. And Joseph took the body and he wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a stone to the entrance of the tomb, and he went away. 
So why is this part of Jesus' story important? Because it proves that Jesus had really died and that he was buried not by one, but two influential, respected men who could testify to the fact that here was certain evidence from reputable witnesses that Jesus really died. Also, the fact that Pontius Pilate, an independent witness, knew that Jesus was truly dead, confirmed by the centurion. These last sad rites seemed to be performed by friendly hands. Joseph and Nicodemus reverently took down the pierced and bleeding body. Then after the usual ablution, the sacred head was covered with the napkin, the sidarian, and the holy body was wrapped tenderly and carefully in broad bands of the finest linen. Covered with thick layers of the costly aromatic preparation of which Nicodemus had prepared. This was to pre- preserve the remains from any corruption, which might set in before they could proceed with the process of embalming, which was delayed necessarily until after the Sabbath and the Passover day had, were passed. Jesus adds, or John adds rather, as the manner of the Jews is to bury probably marking the Jewish custom of embalming and thus preserving the body as contrasted with burning, which was the Roman custom. And we're not talking about modern day cremation here. The Roman custom was to leave the body on the cross as a warning to others, then throw them on the garbage pile outside the wall and burned. This area was known as the dump of Gehenna, otherwise referenced as the fires of hell. Now moving on to this last Sabbath of the Old Covenant, we read in Luke chapter 23, verse 55, the women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. It is noticeable that this is the only record in the Gospels of that memorable Sabbath. Can we picture to ourselves how those who had taken part in the great drama of the previous day spent it? Caiaphas and the priests are officiating in the temple services that day after their hurried Passover, just in time to fulfill the bare letter of the law on the previous afternoon. The crowds that had mocked and scoffed on Golgotha, crowding the courts of the temple, or attending in the synagogues of Hebrew or Hellenistic Jews. Scribes and Pharisees preaching sermons on the history and the meaning of Passover, and connecting it with the hope of a fresh deliverance for Israel. And the disciples, where were they? scattered each to his own lodging or meeting in the guest chamber where they had eaten their paschal supper, or as that was apparently a new room to them in some other inn or lodging in the city or in its suburbs. On that Sabbath, John and Peter must have met, and the penitent must have found in his friend's love the pledge in earnest of his Lord's forgiveness. The 12 and the 70 must have, in groups of twos or threes, mourned over the failure of their hopes. The women have comforted them with the thought that they could at least show their reverence for the Lord they loved as they had never shown it before. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea have rested with satisfaction in the thought that they could honor a dead Christ without the danger that had attached to honoring a living one or have reproached themselves for the cowardice that had kept them from an open confession until it was too late and then mourned over their irrevocable past. Finally, our third point. God uses prophecy to accomplish his purpose. The following servant song in the book of Isaiah makes some of the clearest references to the work of Jesus to be found in the Old Testament. Jesus himself taught his disciples that he fulfilled at least part of it. And several New Testament writers took their cue from him. Please read with me on the screen, Isaiah, beginning at Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely, and he shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred 
beyond human semblance, and he's formed beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him smitten, stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that's led to slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his own generation, as, as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Isn't God amazing? So many hundreds of years before the death of Christ, this prophecy was being read to the Jews. This shows the continuation of the Old Testament right into the New Testament. It's important to note that the body of Jesus remains substantially intact, fulfilling the Old Testament prophecy. John tells us that a trial was made as to whether Jesus was dead. He died in less time than persons crucified commonly did. It showed that he had laid down his life of himself. The spear broke up the very fountains of life, no human body could survive such a wound. But its being so solemnly attested shows that there was something peculiar in it. The blood and the water that flowed out signified the two great benefits which all believers partake of through Christ. Justification and sanctification. Blood for atonement, water for purification. They both flowed from the pure side of our Redeemer. To Christ crucified, we owe merit for our justification and the spirit and grace for our sanctification. Let this silence the fears of the weak Christian and encourage their hopes. There came both water and blood from Jesus' pure side to both justify and sanctify them. May we ever look to him whom by our sins we have ignorantly and heedlessly pierced and who shed from his wounded side both blood and water, that we might be justified and sanctified in his name. Matthew gives additional insight about the Jewish leaders inadvertently helping fulfill Scripture. On the Sabbath, the Pharisees and chief priests gathered together with Pilate, saying that when Jesus was still alive, he said he would rise again in three days. 
They were granted guards. They went to seal the tomb so no one would have access. Consequently, they set up the only possible explanation when he wasn't there. That he rose from the dead. All these features of his burial show the providential power of God. The people involved, the events as they unfolded, and the prophecy that foretold what was to come. Let us go into this next week with this in mind. The plan that Jesus has for producing the highest good remains the same 2,000 years after he walked this earth. Transpire, trans, transform, inspire, and equip people to go forth into the world in his name, guided in love by the Holy Spirit to disciples of all nations. You are a vital piece of this plan. And you can make a difference right here in this body of believers by stepping forward to serve and honor his plans. Let's run the good race. Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you so much for the words that you've given us both in Old Testament and in New Testament. We thank you for the crucifixion and then the resurrection of Christ, your son. That makes these words come true and makes these words come alive. And we know that after the resurrection that we were given the Holy Spirit as the power from you to accomplish your will and accomplish your plans in, in, our, in this world, in our community, and in our own families. Father, I just pray that... Uh, that all would, would uh, ears would hear and eyes would see and become the hands and feet to make your plan come true as we know it will. In your name we pray, amen. Thanks so much for listening. If you would like to give to our ministry, please check out our website at lewistonocc.org. And don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe to this podcast as well as our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram so you're always up to date with what's going on here at Orchards Community Church. Take care and God bless.